like every single day people come in out of their minds on methamphetamine. Oh, wow. And of course they have cardiac stuff from that as well. Like yeah, of never, course they got arrhythmias. Had, yeah. I've never had a single anabolic steroid related emergency room visit in over 20 years with, with one okay. exception. Welcome to Figures Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Andrew Wingy, who has got a YouTube channel called Man Medicine and one of the most alpha logos I've seen so far. And I've seen a lot of guys in this fitness industry. You've got a great logo. Hey, Andrew, please yes. tell us a little bit about yourself. I, I found your um, YouTube channel a while back and you mm -hmm. seem to be up and coming. So I figured to uh, come over here and let's talk shop. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks so much for the invitation. Yeah, I started the channel, I guess, I think it's been a little bit over a year just to maybe start putting out some more detailed information in the area of age management, men's health, that sort of thing. My background, I mean, I, I'm a conventionally trained MD. I'm um, I'm double boarded in, in family medicine and emergency medicine. I still practice emergency medicine. I was just in the ER all last week working, oh, so okay. uh, you know, I'm back home now. So so I still I still like am right in the thick of it. Uh, I like to say I'm, I'm, I have a front row seat to the collapse of the U.S. healthcare system because I'm, I'm right <laughs> yeah. there like, in the middle of it. But then I also I have a, a small men's health telemedicine practice that I've been running for a while as well that I um, where I do health optimization. I, it's exclusively for men. And it's something that I really, really, really enjoy, uh, something I've been doing for quite some time. And um, it's it's something that I'm going to be growing as I get older. I've just turned 50. So, you know, emergency medicine is great. It's it's exciting. Um, but as you get older, you know, it gets harder and harder. You're working night shifts, yeah. you're working swing shifts. I mean, anybody that's, uh, you know, anybody that works in the emergency room knows exactly what I'm talking about. So I, uh, you know, I've been a physician now for 23 years. I did all of my training wow. through the U.S. military so uh because i i was broke <laughs> i was broke as a college student so i uh i went to the uniform services university which is a u.s military run medical school that is kind of a pretty it's like a well-kept secret i think it's i guess you could kind of think of it as like west point for doctors so uh, i had a very long like commitment and payback you know for that so i was in the air force for 17 years i made it up to the rank of lieutenant colonel and then oh, you know, wow. okay. finally separating and then, um, you know, was trying to decide what I wanted to do when I grew up after I got out. So, uh, I've settled down now in, in central Oregon and I'm working, uh, mm -hmm. you know, working my room shifts. I have family out here and, uh, you know, I've been running my age management practice ever since. So that's, uh, that kind of brings cool. us up to. Yeah. And how, how do you feel the tea, like the going on social media? Has that helped you kind of get your word out there and, and discuss a little bit more about your it's been really interesting. All about? I, I, yeah, it's been very interesting. I, I didn't know what to expect. It's something that I think a lot of people think about starting a YouTube channel and they they kick it around for a few years. And I was one of those guys. And I said, finally, like, you know what? I just need to do it. Like, I can think about this all day long mm -hmm. and plan it. I just need to go ahead and do it because um you know, it, if you don't execute, you can you can plan all day, but you ultimately you have to execute. It's just like with going to the gym. I mean, you have to execute. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I I see on YouTube. You know, YouTube. You can find anything on YouTube, obviously, and there are some really good websites or sorry, good channels with you know rock solid information for men. Yours is one of them. There's a handful of other ones that are really good, but there's also you know, I hate to say it, but there's also like some some quackery out there and some misleading oh, yeah. information or, <laughs> or things that are like maybe taken oh, yeah. out of context. You know, I'm trying to be mm -hmm. nice. <laughs> so I thought, you know, I, I'm a very again, I'm I'm conventionally trained, so I I, I try to be evidence based in everything that I recommend mm -hmm. and that I do for patients, knowing that there's not always a ton of evidence for some of the stuff that we do, but mm -hmm. um, you know, it, which doesn't mean it doesn't work or it's not useful, but. So I wanted to kind of create a platform where I can put out good information for patients because ultimately, I guess one of the big messages I have is that, you know, the healthcare system in the United States, and really, I talk to guys all over the world in this practice, it's it's not headed to a good place. And and you don't no. want to be sucked into it because once you're in, it's sort of like the, it's like the proverbial belly of the beast. So 
you know, the only way to stay out of the medical system is to be as as healthy as you possibly can. You know, not just when you're young, you have to start when you're young, but, you know, it, in your 50s and 60s and 70s, you know, that's when yeah. uh, that's when the wheels come off for a lot of people and they end up on in my my world in the emergency room. And by that point, it's a lot of times it's too late. So I wanted to, you know, give guys information yeah. that mm-hmm. they can use to make good healthcare decisions because, you know, I mean, just like anything in life, like you can't make good decisions if you don't have good information. And and ultimately, true. you know, Very one true. of the take home messages of my channel is that like you're responsible for your own health care. Um, you know, the, mm-hmm. the days of like relying on your doctor to keep you healthy are over. Um, one, your doctor no. probably doesn't know. <laughs> You know, they, they it, we, work, we do live in a sick care system, right? So, um, yeah. you know, to if if you're sort of in that, if you're normal, whatever that may be today, they don't really know what to do with you. Uh, if you're normal and say you want to be super healthy, you know, if you go to your regular internist, family know. medicine doctor, urologist, they don't know what to do. Um, no, they so only know what the, to do the with preventative you once you're medicine. Sick. Yeah, pre- preventative medicine barely exists in the Western world oh, yeah. where you go yeah, to yeah. a hospital Absolutely. and you ask them and you say, hey, I want to do some blood work. I want to do some organ imaging. Can you please check this oh, yeah, little check. nodule on my skin? Yeah. They just turn you away because you don't yeah. have any symptoms. So this is a problem for a lot of people. Who, right. A lot of problem for a lot of people who like to stay on top of their health. Okay, because there's mm-hmm. not a, a direct issue going on right yet, uh, right now, yeah. but they want to be ahead of it and prevent anything from ever happening. This is yeah. why I like countries like Thailand or Dubai or some other places in the world where you can just walk into a private hospital and say, listen, yeah. I got mm-hmm. a potential problem X, Y, Z. Can we mm-hmm. tack it off? And if it costs me like $2,000 out of pocket and we don't find anything, great. I paid $2,000 for That's ease of news. mind. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Good news. Yeah. Yeah. It won't happen here. It won't happen here. I mean, I can tell you, I can tell you all kinds of stories about that. You know, I, I actually went into the, I get my care at the VA. So I asked the VA, I wanted to get an, a CT angiogram, uh, you know, cause I, I have a terrible, if you watch some of my videos, my family history for heart mm-hmm. disease is terrible. I have a uh, high lipoprotein right. a, which we can talk about. Mm-hmm. And, um, so yeah, so, you know, I, I asked my intro, I knew what they would say, but I thought I would just ask, you know, Oh no, no, you can't, we don't do CTAs. Uh, unless you've already had a heart attack or you're actively having chest pain. Uh, like, okay. All right. Like, so, you know, it, it's, so basically it's you got to wait until you're close to death. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, so ultimately it does come down to, you know, to making, you have to just take it into your own hands. And, you know, if you're not a physician and you're not medically trained or you don't, you know, like you haven't taken the time you know, it takes many years to, to learn this stuff, regardless of whether you're a physician or not, you know, it, how, how do you make those decisions? Like you can be led down the wrong path by someone who maybe doesn't have the best of intentions or is trying to sell you something. So anyway, my, my goal ultimately with the channel is just to give people good information that they can make good decisions with. And, and you know, I, I see the end result in the emergency room every day of what, mm-hmm. um, what doing nothing it results in, you know, it's, if, if you, if you take a passive yeah. role in your health, I mean, it's the, it's entirely predictable where you're going to end up. I see it every single day. You're going to be coming in. I know. Heart, yeah. heart attack, stroke, diabetes. I mean, the, the population that I see in the emergency department, it's hard to even relate to people who don't work in the healthcare system, like just how sick these people are. And, and, and they're acutely sick, but really they're chronically sick. So they're oh, everybody's lifestyle, obese. lifestyle sickness, right? The diabetes yeah. and, and the oh, smoking yeah. and the drinking and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, so I just spent an entire mm-hmm. month in the United States and I, I traveled all over, right? I went to mm-hmm. Detroit, I went to Columbus, Chicago, oh, LA, yeah. uh, Las Vegas, Florida, man, I, I went all over the place, Sacramento. Yeah. And, and so I, I got a good slice of America this time. And yeah. I came to the conclusion that general Americans are not very healthy. Oh my God. It's, it, no. it's, it's pretty alarming, honestly, it's as, a foreigner. Is a yeah, as a foreigner. Yeah. Yeah. Did you go to Disneyland or Disney World? Disney World. Disney World was the worst. That's that's yeah, literally like that's Wall-E. Yeah. Did you have p- people in all kinds of shapes and sizes riding scooters mm-hmm. and you mm-hmm. know people with special needs, whether those are faked or real. I mean, it's it, and 
right. the the diabetes level of Disney World is just alarming. It's, Plus, it's Disney caters to it because everything oh. is sugar. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> everything Giant is sugar pretzels, over there. So it, enormous pretzels yeah. and drinks and everything's supersized, yeah. right? Everything, including yeah, the people. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, full with sugar. So it's it's alarming to mm -hmm. see, and mm -hmm. and you know, so especially living in Asia for such a long time, where most people are somewhat in shape, you know, of course, right. diabetes and, and lifestyle diseases are rising over here. But it's it's, worse. generally speaking, people at least appear yeah. to be healthier uh, right. on the outside. But then again, yeah. of course, if you send them for blood work and organ imaging, it's probably the same stuff. Right. I just think that general population is, is really on a decline. It's so especially bad. the Western world. It's so and, and of course, you see this. Yeah, you see this quite often in your practice. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm only exposed to it when I go out to a public place. Um, mm -hmm. But what I see yeah. in the fitness industry is a lot of steroid abuse, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Performance yeah. enhancing drug sure, um, sure. mismanagement. Yeah. So do you see that in, in your practice, <laughs> like where you get some guys that are, you know, into steroids or that kind of stuff, and then they get coronary artery disease or, or kind of other kinds of cardiovascular issues? Not uh, when really. they come in? So not, not in my emergency mm. medicine practice. This, um, you know, the, the population that I see, I see tons of coronary artery disease. I mean, I get heart attacks every single day, strokes, all that right. sort of stuff. But it's from the stuff, it's from the usual things you would expect, right? It's decades of mm. uncontrolled high blood pressure, de decades of uh, hyperglycemia, decades of, of lipids through the roof and terrible diet and obesity. And, and actually, like, tons of methamphetamines like methamphetamines is a huge issue in the, oh. just everywhere in the united states and so we're wow. like th it's a, it's not unusual to have like three generations of a family at the hospital they're all hooked on m methamphetamines and and of course fentanyl is now the new thing um right. as well so, so are we are we talking about methamphetamines that are prescribed in the form of Adderall, no, no. Vyvanse, Dexedrine, no. or this is the street amphetamines? Yeah, this is the, yeah the stuff coming up from in, in where I am, and I think most of the states now it's all coming up from Mexican labs. Mm -hmm. So um, there there are still mom and pop uh, you know meth labs like out in the country, <laughs> but I think they've those have you know they've been law enforcement is you know t is pretty active on those, but there's no shortage mm -hmm. of like every single day people come in out of their minds. On methamphetamines oh, wow. and, and of course they have cardiac stuff from that as well but yeah I've of never, course they got arrhythmias I've never, had, yeah. I've never had a single anabolic steroid related emergency room visit in over 20 years with with one okay. exception one exception so i had uh -huh. a, a, an elderly guy who got a really bad infection in his quad from a mm. um he from his testosterone injection and that was, mm -hmm. that was it. He actually had, he was, he had necrotizing fasciitis, which that's the flesh eating bacteria that you yeah. hear about in the news. And that was from, you know, pre probably not the most sanitary, uh, in, you know, intramuscular injection into his quad. That's the only time mm -hmm. I've ever seen a PED related ER visit. And, but you wouldn't expect okay. it, right? I mean, the problems with PEDs, um, I mean, you know, better than anybody it's, it's, it's going to be heart attacks and strokes, but it's going to be years down the road. Like, like a lot of times after your competitive career is over, um, oh, yeah. that's when mm -hmm. these bodybuilders yeah. are dying, you know, and they're maybe in their fifties, late forties, that kind of stuff. So it's like, they're not, they're not maybe even actively on anything right now, but then they're, you know, they're running into, you know, they end up on dialysis or they have kidney failure, um, right. that sort of thing. So, so that's not, yeah, yeah it's not a common thing in that part of my practice. Now guys come to me in my, my men's health practice who have abused PEDs for sure. And I've got a, a small yeah. number of guys that I, I try to do damage control and I monitor their health and, and try to keep them safe because they're not, you know, they're not going to stop. And that's, you know, it's, it's their decision obviously. Um, but, you know, I just, I help keep them a little bit safer maybe than they normally would be. Yeah. That's the, that's the same what I did for many years with, yeah, with bodybuilding exactly, exactly coaching. Exactly. Like, mm -hmm. You're still going to take the steroids. They still want to compete or they still want to yeah. look good for social media or for whatever vanity yeah. purposes. So yeah. you just got to make them do blood work like every month, every couple of months and do some organ imaging to shove it under yeah. your notes. Like yeah. if you do this, your blood work is shit. And if you do this, yeah. your blood work is less shit, Yeah, but it's it still makes it shit. More real. <laughs> it makes it more real to yeah. them, right? And sure you saw, you see the yeah. piece of paper and the, you know, look, oh, this is you on trend. <laughs> this is not good. Yeah. Not good. <laughs> so, uh, exactly. So I do yeah. have some of those guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So, so in your like in your personal experience, in your personal history, have you dabbled yourself with these anabolic energetic steroids, or have you always I, stick to like testosterone replacement therapy and and never felt the need no, to? No, I haven't. I, I I came pretty close a few times in college, but it was a different world, man. Mm-hmm. When I was coming up, like I I I yeah. was in I was in in college in nineteen in the early nineties, so 90, 90, 1991 at a small town college, mm-hmm. and and I was at a gym. There were some pretty good bodybuilders there. In fact, uh, like Stan Efferding was there, like in his early twenty, mid twenties. So he was there. Oh, right. That's and there was, funny. There was a there was kind of like an unspoken underground back then, mm-hmm. and you kind of had to know somebody. It wasn't like it's not in your face like it is today. There was no social media. No. And and honestly, no, you had to earn it. I was. Yeah, you had to earn it, and I was terrified of steroids because there was you know <laughs> nobody knew anything about them. The only books we had, we had the old, um, remember Dan Duchesne's like underground steroid handbook right. and, um, oh, was it uh, anabolic. Bill Phillips, like, anabolic yeah. reference guide. All right. And, and, and so just I anabolic, just like, uh, I don't know, XYZ edition by uh, James Lowen from the UK. That, yes. that one became quite popular. And, and yes. the funny thing is all those three handbooks full with misinformation. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Full. Yeah. Now they're all wrong. <laughs> yeah. But that's all yeah. we had, you know, back then. Yeah. That's so all I would had. read that yeah. stuff and I just was like, Oh, I don't know. And then, you know, I was so, I, I was, I was hyper focused. I was a, I was a good kid. Like I didn't drink, I didn't smoke, I didn't party. Like I was in my, I was in chemistry lab, like when all the guys were out mm-hmm. partying, like I was trying to get into medical school. So right. uh, there were definitely times when I was tempted because I, I really started growing. I, I think I, I, you know, I had fairly decent genetics um, growing mm-hmm. up, and I responded really well. And so I didn't feel like I needed them because um, I would see guys at the gym. Mm. They would use there was Sustanon and Anadrol fifty was like the two things that were going around the gym periodically. Right. And I remember one guy in particular that you know he would blow up you know forty fifty pounds, and then he would come off and he would lose like everything. And I, so I would see this guy <laughs> go through the roller coaster. <laughs> And I thought, man, what's the point? Like, you're, you're, you know, you're gaining all this muscle and you lose it all. Meanwhile, you know, I, I was training naturally and I, I was making just nice, steady progress. So I was happy mm. with that. I was too scared. I think if I was coming up today with the more, more information and, and things on social media, I mean, I think mm. that, and then the access, I think, is greater now than it was. Yeah. You, you had to kind of know somebody who knew somebody back then. You know, I probably as a 19 year old kid, yeah, I don't think I could have resisted that temptation, but but I didn't. Um, nowadays, it's no, no, nowadays it's a lot harder. Was, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, nowadays it's a lot harder because all these kids are exposed to steroids through social media, and you know, everybody's yeah. open and honest about it. Yeah, and I think with all the steroid education that's out there, I think a lot of people think that they're ready earlier. Yeah. And they are yeah. really ready for the steroids. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So they watch a couple of my videos and some of your videos, some other mm-hmm. educators' videos. They're so like, you know what? This makes sense. Let's get started. Right, let's do it. But yeah. Yeah, let's do it. Right. And then mm-hmm. they don't go through that process of kind of earning it. Like I was drug free for 11 years. So I trained yeah. from like as a bodybuilder, yeah. natu- nat- natural bodybuilder. Mm-hmm. I, didn't, mm-hmm. I didn't get get so far. Mm-hmm. Uh, from 15 years old to 26. And then yeah. I felt, you it's know weird. what? I, I did enough research, yeah. right? I, yeah. I did enough research. Let's start with one ampule of testosterone, which everybody thought I was crazy, yeah. but I yeah. just, I was scared also. Right? I didn't yeah. know what to expect. Yeah. And I'm happy yeah. I did because I read all those cycle logs on steroid.com mm-hmm. and professional mm-hmm. muscle and intense mm-hmm. muscle and, you know, muscle mayhem. I read all those cycle logs and people just, in the first couple of weeks, they get good results, and then the side effects start, right? The gyno and the moon phase and the water retention yeah. and the acne yeah. and all that. So yeah. I realized, okay, let's start low. And I saw that around me because I had several yeah. classmates who went to the, the steroid jar of their parents. So they got like Thai, thai B, T-balls and Thai anadrols. Okay. Okay. Yeah, they had those big 1,000 uh, 1, yeah. uh, yeah. tablet jars of five mm-hmm. milligrams. And they would just grab because ah, dad takes it, I take it. So they would blow up and then the, the jar would be finished and they would shrink yeah. just like you saw, oh right, gosh. in the gym. So I got exposed to the wrong side and then the guys who were doing it right, the IFB pros or the competitors, mm-hmm. they just kept their mouth shut, right? Until yeah. at one point yeah, I exactly. asked about it after 10 exactly. years showing up to the gym. Mm-hmm. So I, I guess in that sense, we were lucky that we didn't get exposed mm-hmm. to it early, uh, but I wish I had access to the information because I still made plenty of mistakes when I got started. Oh, sure. And then, yeah. 
I'm, I'm not sure how this was for you, but for me, it was like, okay, I made the decision, right? Now this entire new world of performance enhancing drugs opens up and there's thousands of them <laughs> that you can try. It's so amazing. I, I went yeah. down a it pretty rabbit hole. Yeah. Blows your mind. Yeah. And I, I don't consider myself a, a PED expert. I, you know, I learn from guys like you and, and, you know, and my patients come in and they, you know, they tell me mm -hmm. they're on things. I'm like, I don't even know what that is. I need to go learn about it. Oh shit! But, yeah. <laughs> you know, just to circle back, but you're absolutely right. It, it, there's a lot to be said for maximizing your genetic potential before hopping on any sort of, you know, performance enhancing substance. Yeah. Because I, I think a lot of people also, they underestimate what their bodies are capable of, um, mm -hmm. and how much muscle tissue, especially if you do, if you're doing everything else correctly, um, you could build a pretty darn good physique naturally. And then if certainly, if you want to take it to the next level, now you've got the information to do it safely. Uh, you can find, now it's easier to find doctors, you know, like myself. And there's a lot of mm -hmm. other ones out there that are, would are, are not going to like wave their finger at you and 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 um, look down on you or refuse to take care of you. There, there are doctors that are willing to monitor athletes now that want to go that route. But mm -hmm. it it, yeah. it it's kind of heartbreaking because I you know I work out at a nice local gym here and there's all these these kids are probably like 18 to 20 years old and they're, they're all on gear and they, yeah. Or on SARMs, even, even worse. They don't, a lot of, <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot of the little SARM goblins, they call them in there <laughs> and you can spot them. You, you know who they are. Like you can just Easy. tell. Yeah. They got broad, broccoli haircuts. They do like yeah, sumo deadlifts yeah. and they got, yeah. you know, all the latest yeah. fitness apparel, the young yeah. LA and the vanquish yeah. and the, I don't know, whatever. They, out, like, they all look the thumb. same. Oh the man, same. and that, that's the thing I noticed when I was in the U.S. Like mm -hmm. all these young kids, they all look the same. All they look do. the same. They do. And then say, hey, do you know this guy's got like three million followers? I said, I've never seen this guy, and I don't really care because right. <laughs> there's it's nothing amazing. to learn there. You know? No. Yeah. <laughs> it's then, nothing. Yeah. No. So they all they all kind of graduate. Like all these kids, they kind of follow each other, right? And they they have huge followings. Like Sam Sulik, for example, he just blew up. And yeah, I think yeah. if you look in his YouTube yeah. YouTube analytics. Mm -hmm. His audience is like 15, 18, maybe 25 right. years old. Mm -hmm. And then after that, it starts mm -hmm. to taper off rapidly. Or I'm sure if you look into your audience and my audience, it's like 25 to 30 and then, yeah. uh, you know, it, 30 it to 40. And then it starts yeah. to taper off. I've mm -hmm. a very little young guys. So the young guys follow the young guys. And then as you get older, you follow more of the older guys. Um, mm -hmm. And some of the young guys follow the older guys too. I mean, I'm, I meet them all the time, you know, here in mm -hmm. Thailand or at the, yeah. in America. Um, but, but it's, it's just, I think there's so much pressure for these kids just to get started early while they're not ready yeah. at all. And all of the media. people that they follow, yeah. yeah, all the people that they follow are in gear and, and saucing pretty yeah, hard. Absolutely. Yeah. Whether they admit it or not. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, they, you know, they, yeah. they're all starting early. They're, they're wrecking their HPTA access. They're potentially compromising mm -hmm. their fertility. So they're, you know, they're, they're, they're experiencing, they're putting themselves at all of the, the risk of what all this risk that comes with PDs for a, ultimately for a physique that if they had just been a bit more patient and if they had been a bit more knowledgeable, they could mm -hmm. have achieved that same physique without yeah. any of the, the, the negative side effects. And then they could have taken it even further if they had chosen right. to go down the PED route. You know, at a later that's, point. That's but, the worst thing. What I see, yeah. yeah, that's the worst thing. What I see, all these young kids, they take PEDs and SARMs and whatever, mm -hmm. and they look natural. Yes, and that yes. that that kind of that kind of hurts when I point? see that. I'm like, yeah, yeah what's the fucking point? what's the point? <laughs> but their like, lipids, their lipids are not natural. Their the liver are enzymes natural. are not their natural. Are not natural, <laughs> and they're no. you know they're yeah they're they're shut down. They're shut down. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it's, it's just, it, it's, it's that American, I want it now mentality that now is like spread out all over the world. It's, it's I, I shouldn't have it's to worldwide. wait. I shouldn't have to work hard. Um, you know, the whole idea of like just delayed gratification, there's a lot to be said mm -hmm. for that, but it's, it's not a trait that's as common as it used to be. You know, no. like in our no. generation or, you know, definitely older, like our parents, you know, you had to work hard to get someplace in life, and 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 now everyone's looking for a shortcut. It's kind of cliche to say that. I know every generation says mm -hmm. that, like, my generation was better than your generation, but yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. You know, everybody, every generation. <laughs> my dad makes fun of my generation, of course. You know, uh, yeah. for the you know what's, what's 
true. But what, what I do think that contributes is because a lot of these young kids are on social media now. They're they're making a lot of money. And when I say a lot, it's oh, like 50, yeah. 100, yeah. 150,000, 300,000 <laughs> per month. Right? Yeah. And a lot of young kids want a piece of that pie. I mean, I want a piece of that pie too. Don't get me wrong. Sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You know, three hundred thousand a month is is a good is a good amount of income, um, but you know when when kids hear that potential, they're like, you know, the light bulb switches. Like, okay, if I want to reach this, I need gear because otherwise I can't blow up on social yeah. media. And yeah. unfortunately, to a certain extent, that's true because all of the guys that blew up and make good money mm-hmm. are all on gear. Hundred percent, a hundred percent. Yeah, and I try to stay off social media as much as possible, but. You know, just because of the, mm-hmm. just for my business here, and 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 just even things like just taking staying in touch with family and friends, you can't, you know, mm-hmm. you can't avoid it. It gets put in my feed. Yeah, I see this. They're they're all on gear. They're all on something, yeah. and you know, it's it's just it's just it's like a whole new world. It's so bizarre to me. You know, it's it just because I'm old. <laughs> it's because I it right. didn't exist. So when, when, it when, did not exist for me when growing up. No, it's no, it's thing. something of the last five years. It's only the last five yeah. years uh, mm-hmm. after the in, uh, inception of Instagram and YouTube becoming popular mm-hmm. and monetizable. It's mm-hmm. just gone haywire, basically. Mm-hmm. So in your clinic, do you see like a lot of young kids, like 15, 20, 25 no. years old, just getting started? No, it's, it's mostly older guys. It's mostly older guys that reach out to me. And, and mm-hmm. you know, for legal reasons, I, I only see 18 and above. Um, so I haven't, I haven't had to do any, you know, and I'd probably have to turn them away. Um, at least, at least formally, I I have no problem, like taking a young man aside in the gym and having a, you know, giving him a few words of wisdom, because I think that, you know, if I feel like he needs it, but yeah, most of probably the average age in my clinic is, is mid forties. Uh, okay. which I think if you look across most men's health clinics and, uh, age sort of age management clinics, that's probably the demographic where most men, right. they, that's when they really start suffering from low testosterone. Um, mm-hmm. although nowadays, I mean, it's getting, you know, it's getting younger and younger and younger. Uh, and yeah, I do have a so few that's guys surprising. that are young. Yeah. It's surprising to see, but I think it's mostly lifestyle related because I it made is. a video about the declining testosterone levels mm-hmm. and I looked at all the scientific evidence mm-hmm. and, and you just see that a lot of it is just related to lifestyle. It and is. even it's complex. Even they mentioned that in the studies is something that, you know, they can't really yeah. determine, but it's probably mm-hmm. ex- external factors that, yeah. that testosterone yeah. levels are, are going down. And I, I mean, all you have to mm-hmm. do is kind of look around yourself and see how, you know, poorly people are managing their health. So as an example, mm-hmm. I've been on a diet eating healthy since I was about 15, 17 yeah. years old. Yeah. Me too. And my testosterone levels were about six, 700, mm-hmm. you know, drug free. Mm-hmm. And now at age 40, even though mm-hmm. I'm doing HCG monotherapy, mm-hmm. my testosterone levels are still six, 700. Yeah. But I've been eating healthy for 25 yeah. years. So yeah. mine is going reason, to right? an American going that's... on holiday. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's one of the reasons. Yeah. And I'm physically active, low oxidative stress, taking some antioxidants. Mm-hmm. Right? So I, I got the prime example in the, in the shape of my own parents mm-hmm. who were smokers and drinkers and not eating mm-hmm. healthy and then getting all these health issues when they were my age, mm-hmm. right? They, they were already yeah. on the decline when yeah. they're 40 yeah. and or 70 years old, right? right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. So it's on the decline and now it's even worse and they, they don't listen. So, you know, I tried my part <laughs> and uh, I became a health expert for myself. So I had uh, like how not to do it. So I, I went to the gym, right? I did my cardio. I mm-hmm. ate healthy as, as uh, knowledgeable as I was at the age of 15. Mm-hmm. And I kind of progressed over time. And now I feel like at the age of 40, it's finally starting to pay off because when I compare yeah. myself to all the kids and, and, and people at university that didn't do that, I know. oh man, it's astounding. And when I look at you, I'm sure you feel the same way because at 50, oh, yeah. you look fucking killer, right? Yeah, you, you perform at a very high level and you look mm-hmm. great. And then I'm sure when you compare yourself to 50 years old from, you know, back in the days or just general 50 years old, you're like, yeah. they can't believe that you're 50, right? And it's people can't a, believe that I'm 40 in my age demographic. Yeah. You nailed it. Absolutely nailed it. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, I, I mean, I started the same, I got into fitness and health, like in my early teens and, you know, I was you know, just methodical about never missing workouts, eating well, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when you're in your twenties, everybody, everybody, you know, a lot of your peers that are not doing that, they, they, especially if they've got good genetics, they still kind of look okay. They look good. Yeah. Um, uh-huh. they, or at least they don't look terrible. 
But yeah, I mean, I, I think I noticed it in my late thirties for sure. And now it's like insane, but like, you know, I've started to diverge from my peer groups. So in terms of like <laughs> yeah. overall health. So, right. um, yeah, when, you know, like I, I see the, the 50 year olds that I see in the emergency department, these guys are my age and you know, they've got kidney disease. They've already had like two stents in their heart. They're 300 pounds. You know, they, they haven't had a good erection in like eight years. They, they're on like Probably 17 see it different either. prescription drugs. <laughs> and it's, and I'm just like, wow, like it's, it, it really, this is such a, I, I tell guys that are starting this stuff, like, of course you have to start early, but this is an investment that it's like compounding interest, man. You start doing this in like, yeah. say mm-hmm. in your twenties, the big returns, you know, you may not see them in your twenties and early thirties, but man, when you get closer to 40, 50 and then i mean it just gets bigger and bigger in, in your 60s and 70s right. when you're out doing things with your wife and you're on trips and you're going hiking with your grandkids and these other people they're in nursing homes i mean that's that is the inevitable yeah. <laughs> decline yeah. that if you don't do uh-huh. something it's like jumping in a river and just floating along the current you know it's easy you're, you're relaxing in the current but you know the the river is going over a waterfall at some point. So uh-huh. you have to swim like hell to not go over the waterfall and we're all going to go over it eventually. Right. But you want right. to, you want to not go over, you know, as quickly as if you just don't do anything, you're going to go, you're going to go. And especially oh, living that's, that's, in like this toxic environment sure. today, yeah. you know, that mm-hmm. if, if you just do what every other American does, you will look like every other American. And, and, you know, you just, you just defined it perfectly what the average American looks like. It's pretty bad. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's unbelievably bad actually, but that's the norm now. So people, uh, th- their perception of like what normal is, is, is really skewed. I think in the United States in terms of what, you know, I what think if is just... a healthy body fat percentage and it's, right. it's not, you know, the norm is not normal. Um, I think if you're current, constantly close. surrounded by, by, if you're constantly surrounded by unhealthy people that are fat, then you probably think that that's normal. So what I what I noticed with my wife, what I saw with my wife, for example, she's very slender. She's always been fit. You know, she's been training very long time. She's got a good physique at 40 years old. And then you see all the uh, the American girls that look at her like, yeah, what the hell's going on here? Like they're surprised. And then she said she was 40 and she couldn't. They couldn't believe it. Yeah. But they so could your wife is, not is normal, though. That's that's what normal should be. That's normal. Yeah, that's what normal should they're, be. But it's no longer normal. It's a, not. It's not exceptional. Anymore. <laughs> it, well, now it is, no. right? Now it is. But yeah. Really, like everybody should be like your wife. If right. uh, I, you I, just live life, yeah. right? That's what it should be. <laughs> but you know, things have been skewed so much. Um, you know, and the sad part is, and I'm sure you saw it at, at Disney World or Disneyland, but it's the mm-hmm. kids now it's these young children mm-hmm. like i see 200 pound eight-year-olds with fatty liver disease a couple oh, times wow. a week yeah in the emergency department so so that's a whole nother you know it, it used to just be the obesity problem used to be mainly just adults and and was what i was mm-hmm. seeing but now it's like i mean even all the kids are fat too and yeah. so mm-hmm. you know it's, it's so you give them like free free copies of dr jason fung uh fasting and diabetes code and just yeah give it away said, Hey, I feel bad for you. Instead of the prescription, just take this $20 or $30 book yeah. and good luck and stop eating. <laughs> you know, the, the sad thing is though, Steve, I'll tell you, like I, if I did that at the, at the emergency room, they would just take that book and psh, they're just not interested. Yeah. Or they'll, or they'll sue you. <laughs> they'll take your license away. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, people, and that's the other thing too. It's, and maybe it's this like fat acceptance thing, but um, sometimes people, they're just not open to hearing that, they need to lose weight, you know? And, and when I, mm-hmm. when I, whenever I bring that up at the hospital, I'm, I mean, I'm very diplomatic about it. I'm very professional. I'm a nice guy. I'm not <laughs> trying to give yeah. anybody a hard time. I know it's hard to lose weight. You know, it's a metabolic condition, but yeah, like I've had them complain, like, like file a complaint at the hospital that I, you know, how dare I tell them to, to lose weight? I'm like, I, it's, it's my job. With, it's, like, it's my job yeah. to tell you that. 
you know. But it's the same with bodybuilders, though. I mean, you tell a yeah. bodybuilder to lose weight for longevity purposes. Oh yeah, you, they they feel Forget insulted. It. Tell you it takes it takes them ten, fifteen years to <laughs> yeah. get all that size. I'm finally mm -hmm. two hundred sixty, three hundred pounds, and they they don't want to lose it, you know. And then yeah. you know yeah. the fatigue of the heart sets in, and you know yeah. sleep yeah. gets worse. And there's consequences. I think we're all, it has consequences. Yeah, I think just being mm -hmm. heavy it has consequences, regardless of if it's muscle tissue or fat mm -hmm. tissue. Mm -hmm. And you know, it is. You can debate that muscle tissue is worse because it requires more of your physique from a cardiovascular mm -hmm. standpoint, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you're not going to get big for free, right? So drugs are always involved when you're like 250 to 300 pounds. Yeah, yeah when you get that. Um, big. Yeah, whereas if you're 300 pounds fat, it's just food, right? You can fast that off. And you right. see that over and over again, guys that make that lifestyle choice and they, they go from 300 pounds to 200 pounds in a matter of a couple of years. Yeah. Um, but yeah, with the muscle, it's a little bit different because you know mm -hmm. the steroids are involved and steroids are somewhat addictive. I mean, let's be honest. Psychologically, you know, from a right? mental aspect. Yeah, yeah, psychologically. Like yeah. you look in the mirror, you look good, and then you take the steroids yeah. away, you don't look so good anymore. It's mm -hmm. kind of rough. So, yeah. I want, I, let, let's go back to the subject of wives. Like, you have a very interesting story regarding your own journey of fertility. Oh, yeah. And so, yeah. we basically yeah. connected. Yeah. So, I'm on my fertility mm -hmm. protocol, but let, let's go over your uh, story because yeah. it's pretty interesting. Yeah. Well, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the final result is that I've got a one year old son now, which is, is amazing. Even though he kept me up amazing. all night last night, he's still not sleeping very well. So, you have to look That's forward the to life. that. <laughs> so my you know, yeah I, we i've been with my partner for over almost 10 years now and we we have been i won't say we're troy we're sort of not not trying like we just sort of just said whatever let's see what happens about a year mm -hmm. or two into our relationship um but i i have a medical condition that led to both fertility and to ultimately to my low testosterone and that was I was born with bilateral undescended testicles, so um, cryptorchidism mm. is the medical term for it. And I was born, I was born in Spain, actually. And I'm not sure if it it was not picked up or noticed, or maybe the standards were different at in Spain at the time. But you know, typically, if it if if especially you know if a boy is born with bilateral, they want to repair that as quickly as possible. They want to bring them right. down mm -hmm. out of the pelvis. Because the longer the testes are in in the pelvis, uh, at exposed to the higher temperatures, the more damage is done. And so, right. I want to get those guys down into the cool, you know, scrotum, scrotal area. Exactly. Right. So usually by six months is when they want to do that. Well, mine didn't get repaired uh, until I was three years old. So, mm. so there was some definitely some damage done there. The left one yeah. was like totally atrophied. Uh, the right one is just limping along. So, um, you know it. I, I knew from well, basically, as soon as I got into medical school and learned about this, I knew that I would very likely have fertility problems. So, right. if, mm -hmm. if you have a unilateral undescended testes, you're usually okay because the other one, you know, right, still got one that's functional. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Your sperm counts as long as everything else is is okay, and the same with testosterone. Although, certainly, they can they can develop, uh, you know, low testosterone as well. But if if both of them are damaged. Then the probability of you know you having a good sperm count is really low. It's not it's not good. And sure enough, yeah, mine right. mine was not good. It was like I think pre TRT uh, um, that was like seven or eight million you know per mL, which hmm. um, you know the the current WHO upper limit and normal is like fifteen to yes. twenty. But yeah, just like with, to just like with testosterone levels, you know they're are, they're lowering the standards. They're lowering the standards for sperm counts too. So yeah, when uh, you compare like the World Health Organization 2000, uh, 2001 versus 2010, yes. you see that all the parameters got low or some of them got yep. lower. You're yeah. like, hmm. In the 80s, it used to yeah. be 40. If you were below 40 million, that was considered abnormal in the, in the, in the 80s. Oh, really? And then, and then at some point, they lowered that. it. Okay. Yeah, they lowered it to 20. And then now it's like 15 for the WHO. Yeah. So it's just like, oh, yeah, no, and the morphology and the mortality. Yeah, yes. morphology and motility there for reduced that as well. Mm -hmm. Like luckily yeah. for me, my fertility came back with the fertility aids to like phenomenal levels. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But let, let's continue with your story. <laughs> yeah, but that's a testament to your health, you know, overall. So right. um so anyway, but you know, fast forward to about age 35 is when, you know, so back up like presumably I I was I produced enough testosterone, you know, through my formative years. I, I put on a lot of muscle. 
as a natural mm -hmm. athlete. I was a competitive powerlifter. I would compete in the 242s. So, you know, like I think I, oh, I never wow. got my levels checked, but um, you know, presumably like I had pretty decent levels back then. But mid 30s, they yeah. things just sort of fell off a cliff. Um, and I had all of the classic mm -hmm. symptoms that you might expect. And uh, I had a urologist friend of mine, you know, draw some labs on me. Yeah, and sure enough. So I actually had a, it was mostly primary hypogonadism. So, so I had, you know, mm -hmm. quite low tes total testosterone, but my LH and FSH were towards the higher end of the reference range. Um, yeah. It's probably so also no probably, negative feedback from the estrogen because estrogen was probably also low. So you have this yeah, weird, I, like, I you have this. Yeah. Oh, really? It. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Back then, you know, I didn't know, I didn't know anything about this stuff. We're not trained to check that stuff, you know, in, right. in, in conventional medicine. So Anyway, I, um, you know, that's, I'm the kind of person that if, you know, if I'm going to get into something like this, especially if it's going to be for life, I mean, I just, it's like a, it's a deep dive. Like I got to know everything about it. So I took right. as many courses mm -hmm. as I could. I did uh, some training out at the Cenogenics Institute. This is like 2010, 2011. So uh, yeah, then I started on TRT and it was, I mean, absolutely life-changing for me. It, it could have been placebo, but I feel like within the first like three or four days of my first injection, it was like the clouds parted, you know, the, the uh, yeah. sunshine came through. And like, <laughs> and it, was, um, do you remember what product you used? Or was it like, it was, it was like compounded? It was Cipinata. compounded. Yeah, yeah, I think it was actually it was. It was. I don't remember. It, I got it. It was a commercial pharmacy actually. In, in Las Vegas. That's probably 200 milligrams for one milliliter recipient. Correct. And did they yeah, give you like one shot, shot? Yep. I did zero one shot every 6. 10 days, 14 days. No, well, I knew enough to do it. At least I did it once a week then. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, it was like 0 0.6 mLs, I think was my first, my first go through. And, and it was absolutely amazing. So I, I, the, the benefits to TRT for myself, and I've heard this from a lot of guys, they were all like above the neck, meaning, cognition, mm -hmm. mood, uh, focus, yeah. mm -hmm. drive energy. I, I already had a good amount of muscle built. I, I did not see huge performance gains from it probably because mm -hmm. I had already kind of peaked in that area as much as I, yeah, it could be as mm -hmm. I wanted to. So it was all just like, it was everything that it was everything that I needed at the time. So it really changed the whole course of my medical career Cause then I got really interested in it. And, and so, <laughs> you know, fast forward to now, it's been uh, very rewarding to be able to share that with other guys who a lot of times are suffering for years, like way longer than I ever did and getting blown off yeah. by their doctors, mm -hmm. not being listened to. Um, and, and, and then finally being able to turn things around and, and, you know, get somebody that will be willing to treat them. So in some ways it's, it's kind of Do interesting. Like it's, my my men's health practice has been a lot more rewarding from a medical standpoint mm. than the emergency room you know you think in the year ER, like oh you're saving lives like it's you got to feel really good about it but you know there's a lot of stuff that goes on there that you don't feel that good about and and is sort of futile yeah. in some ways but the men's health practice like i i've saved marriages i've saved I've, you know i've had guys tell me that i i help keep them from committing suicide Right. Um, mm -hmm. because they were so depressed. I've been able to get guys off of antidepressants and off of um, antihypertensive medications and, and get them off their diabetes medications. And it's like, you know, as a doctor, like that's, that's why you go into medicine, right? To make those right. life changes. Life changing. Like, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's a feel good thing too. So did, it's, uh, did you get some, some, some older patients that were clearly androgen deficient, like 30, 40, 50 years old, and then their previous doctor put them on a SSRI or another antidepressants because oh, yeah. that's also oh, quite course. common. Oh yeah. 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 Uh, some of them, I mean, this blows my mind, but they told me like their doctor actually refused to even check it, you know, just like wow. wouldn't even entertain it. Like, uh, I'm not joking. One guy said, well, he, he looked at me that he had a beard, you know, he said, listen, you, you've been mm -hmm. able to grow a beard. You don't have low testosterone. <laughs> Just like, like one of the most That's absurd insane. things I've ever heard. Right. Yeah. So yeah, the, there are guys that come with those stories and, you know, it seems like it's happening a little bit less lately, but mm -hmm. there's still yeah, it's just not part of the mainstream medical world, but it really needs to be. Yeah. In fact, that's something that I really want to change the paradigm on. 
you know, I, I am an emergency room doctor, but I'm, I'm a family practice doctor still at heart. I've kept up my boards. There's not enough right. endocrinologists. There's not enough urologists in the world to handle True. this problem. This is a global problem. I, I do consultations mm -hmm. like you do with guys all over the world, Australia, Kuwait. They all have the same issue and, yeah. and they mm -hmm. can't get access to care. So no. like the paradigm needs to change. This needs to be part of the core curriculum of all primary care residencies, in my opinion, is how to manage men on testosterone. Uh, because yeah. this is like, this is a global problem. And funnily, the, funnily enough, like estrogen ignorant. management is on the curriculum for women yeah. men, in oh, form yeah. of birth oh, control of <laughs> and, and the hormonal yeah. uh, contraceptives, yeah. you know, the IUDs, right? The, yeah. the ones you can yeah. enter uterine devices. And yeah. so, so maybe with a couple more years of fighting, we can have our just uh, Jew, but mm -hmm. I, I'm the same. Like I do consultations with men all over the world who don't have mm -hmm. access to hormone replacement therapy clinics or male health optimization clinics. And mm -hmm. you just got to steer them in the right directions and say, listen, stick with compounded or pharmaceutical stuff. Yeah. Start low, look into your neurotransmitters. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I make videos about this stuff so people can get started by yeah, themselves. Exactly. Um, and, and, and then slowly but steady, you know, the guys that want to make a change, they will. Yeah. Uh, and then hopefully they get themselves in a good state of health, you know, because it's, it is quite alarming. Right. And I met plenty of guys who do Very everything alarming. right. Like, I met plenty of guys who do everything right. They go to the gym, they take care of their mm -hmm. health, et cetera, you know, health supplementation, they try some quote unquote test boosters, right? It might help a little bit. Yeah. And then they're still low because they yeah. do an ultrasound and they have like uh, a varicose cell. Right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You know? And so what are you going to do? Are you going to do the surgery or which is sometimes not even available? Or, right. uh, you know, are you going to go with testosterone replacement therapy? Because right. like, like exactly. Stan Efferding, for example, like mm -hmm. we mentioned him yeah. earlier, yeah. St Stan Efferding yeah. had a varicose cell at oh, undiagnosed until he was like yeah. 30 or something. So he was on TRT since a mm -hmm. young age. Mm -hmm. And then he got his varicose cell fixed. And then he had mm -hmm. kids yeah. later on in life like you did. Yeah. I don't exactly know what the age is. It's in the the um, uh, the podcast that I did with him a couple months ago. So he had a similar story as you, right? He was like semi-infertile. He had testosterone replacement therapy because his testicles were not really functioning and he didn't know he didn't have puberty until he was like 21. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So by the time you met him, he was probably on TRT or self-prescribed TRT because. Oh yeah. Yeah. He, he, he was huge. He wasn't right? functioning. Yeah. It was absolutely massive. Yeah, I'm sure. He's like, oh, wait a minute, this yeah. worked. Kind of like Lee yeah, Priest, yeah. right? The 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 the, the story yeah. in the grape, uh, you know, through the grapevine is that uh, Lee Priest was growth hormone prescribed when he was young, oh, and then his mom made yeah. him go to the gym. Yeah, because it was, it was short. So, but, That's his gateway drug. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So his mom made him yeah. go to the gym because his mom was a yeah. bodybuilder, and then you know, probably you know, the uh, can of worms, Pandora's box opened. Mm -hmm. He's like, oh, if growth hormone works, what else works, mm -hmm. right? But it's all. You know, he said yeah, he never took much, so we got to go with yeah. what he says. Um, yeah, so, yeah. so I think like in your case, like if you have a structural issue and in, in mm -hmm. Stan's case and so many mm -hmm. other men, if you have mm -hmm. a structural issue, you need some sort of surgery or some medical intervention, mm -hmm. at least to get your fertility parameters back. Like, yes. did you do some sort of surgery or did you have to use like fertility aids to get your wife pregnant or your girlfriend pregnant? Yeah. So yeah, I'll continue the story. So there isn't really a surgical mm -hmm. intervention for what I have that, you know, the damage is done The you're not going to get those Sertoli cells back. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there are some medical things that you can do. So for, uh, for example, I, so I, I started myself on ACG right out of the gate when I, when I started on oh, yeah. TRT, um, because, you know, I know, mm -hmm. and, and this is important for guys to understand because, you know, the staying on HCG, whatever protocol you use, there's a bunch of ones that but, you know, there's many different ways to cook HCG, obviously, to maintain fertility. But regardless, you know, you will still have a drop in your sperm counts, even if you're just doing HCG mm -hmm. on TRT. It's it's not LH. Yeah. It's not FSH. It's um, it, it will drop your sperm counts. Now, you know, if you have 100 right. million to start with, and let's say now it cuts it in half, which I, I've seen that commonly, that's probably not a problem, right? You're still going to be able to impregnate your, your partner with 50 million sperm. Mm -hmm. But if, if you have 20 million sperm at baseline, which many men do now because things are dropping, mm -hmm. and then you go on TRT and, and HCG, so now you're walking around with maybe 10, now that's a problem. 
And so I, I do yeah. encourage guys in the in, who are in that range to like get a baseline semen analysis before you go down this road, because you might be one of those guys that's that's already like borderline low, and then you know you, it, that's just good information to have. HCG may not be sufficient mm -hmm. for you. You may need to add yeah. in recombinant FSH True. or HMG, like like you did. So what I did, mm -hmm. so I I started on on HCG. Surprisingly, I didn't get a huge drop. In fact, it kind of went up a little bit. It was like 10 million on HCG. So that, that's not okay. normal. <laughs> but um, it still was, you know, we were not having any success at all. And and there also was an issue on her end. Like she's extremely fit. Sounds like like your wife. She had very low body fat percentage. Mm -hmm. So what happens to a lot of women, mm -hmm. obviously, is they stop ovulating, right? Their circle, their cycles get messed up when their body fat's ah, too low. Right. Mm -hmm. So so we had some issues, you know, if with uh on her end as well that it took a number of years to get those straightened out but um ultimately i, I went on uh recombinant fsh and i and i upped my hcg based off of some andrology protocols that i saw in some journals mm -hmm. so higher doses of hcg like 1500 to 2000 twice a week and then uh initially okay. 75 yeah. use monday wednesday friday of of our recombinant fsh and then at one point i went up to 150 to see if if I would get an additional boost from that, and and actually I didn't. The seventy five worked. It was about the same. Oh really? But I was okay. able to get. So I, I did notice that. I did yeah. notice that when I went no, from seventy five yeah. IUs three times yeah. a week to seventy five yeah. IUs every day. That was a significant boost for me. Yeah. Oh good. Significant. Yeah. 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 yeah it's it's variable, and and honestly, I typically if you read the literature on on men who've had undescended bilateral undescended testes they don't always get a great response obviously to hcg and recombinant fsh because right. it's an it's end organ blood flow problem. and then the chronic yeah it's an end organ right. you know, mm -hmm. you're, you're kind of like beating a dead horse but i um i actually got my sperm counts up to over 20 million with that protocol okay and 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 we had we actually had a total of three pregnancies spontaneously from that um, all of them, unfortunately, all of them ended up in miscarriages. So the mm. third one was kind of a questionable one. She had like a positive pregnancy test for like three or four days and then it just went away. So it was probably like very, very early, mm. but the other two yeah. made it to like six and then I think like nine weeks. So I had to do like a DNC oh, wow. and stuff okay. like that. But it, yeah. um, that was the first time I'd ever gotten anybody pregnant, you know, to my knowledge. So, uh, wow. um, it uh it, it was a, <laughs> nice. I, I considered it you know even though obviously we didn't have a successful delivery from that and a baby but i i considered that uh relatively successful for me in terms of it was actually kind of a, a neat experiment to see how these drugs were right with your medical history them, right never, that at least it yeah i never used them on myself so um now the other thing too like i, I should back up a little bit because this applies to a lot of men too is you know if if you're going to work on improving your sperm counts, your sperm counts a lot of times are a reflection of your overall general health. So you really got to get yourself in shape. You got to start eating better. Right. Um, and you'll see that reflected in your sperm counts. I mean, you'll get better motility. Mm -hmm. You'll get less oxidative damage and DNA damage. You'll get less of these deformed sperm. And some of them have two heads or two tails. And you'll see an improvement <laughs> yeah, in that exactly. if, you, if you take care of yourself. Yeah. And there's actually some interesting studies with antioxidants that seem to show some benefits. So I have a little protocol that I recommend for True. men, mm -hmm. and it's the exact same thing that I took for myself. And you know, if anybody wants it, you can write to me. I'll, I'll send it to you. But it's not anything crazy. It's uh, several different antioxidants, NAC, obviously vitamin C, uh, lots of vitamin D, right. zinc, selenium. It's all stuff that is right. actually so same on tau taurine, carnitine, yeah, and vitamin E, right? It's same protocol that everybody does. That. But there's data for yeah. it. There so, is data for it. So it works. I know. I know. I mean, all, all those antioxidants and micronutrients, they help with um, testicular function and prevent oxidative stress. And it's the mm -hmm. oxidative stress in the seminal vesicles that ultimately yes. kill your sperm. Yes. Absolutely. Right? Because the oxidative stress in the testicles is not as much of an issue. But as soon as the, the semen exits the testicles and travels to the seminal vesicles, yeah. where it stays yes. for, you yes. know, until it's ejaculated, that's where the oxidative mm -hmm. damage occurs. And that's where the mor that's morphology right. goes that's down right. and the motility yeah. goes down. So I mm -hmm. tell most people to really up their antioxidants around the yes. time that they uh, want to impregnate their wife. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't have to do it the entire month, only, you know, for let's say 11 days leading up to uh, ovulation and, and impregnation or attempting to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that way, the motility and the morphology stays quite good. So what yeah. I noticed in my my protocol with a thousand IUs HCG three times per week and mm-hmm. 75 IUs FSH every day mm-hmm. and a good amount of antioxidants around, um, mm-hmm. you know, trying to impregnate my wife around the time that I do my fertility check, my s- total semen volume is like four or five milliliters mm-hmm. and I have about four, 400 to 550 million sperm per ejaculate, mm-hmm. which is insane. All right? That's great. I mean, that's amazing. Just, yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. And the morphology yeah. is high and the motility is high mm-hmm. and it's all well be- above World Health Organization standards. Oh, yeah. well uh, above, but because, yeah. because, but because my wife is 40, Mm-hmm. Every time we try to conceive, we have approximately a five percent chance of conception. That's right. So we've been we've been doing six months already, and uh, nothing so mm-hmm. far. <laughs> but mm-hmm. at my age, and even though we're both in good states of health, you know, because you're older, mm-hmm. and the nestling of the egg, right, to to attach to the you know the yeah. wall of the, mm-hmm. the uterine wall, right, mm-hmm. and before it can form, uh, you know, a life form, a baby that it just they have a very low uh, chance. So what I noticed, my wife's period has changed since we started conceiving, because I think you know, the earlier steps are, are successful, and then afterwards, something happens where it just doesn't proceed into pregnancy. So mm-hmm. it's, it's just, a, I guess it's a slow process when you're older. Like, it took you how many years before your girlfriend finally got pregnant? Like, how many years I mean, and how many attempts? I mean, gosh, uh, I mean, it was... We kind of got went off birth control uh, about a year and a half into our relationship. We've been together ten years, and then we we really oh, actively wow. tried with with the best sperm counts that I could produce, uh, probably for about yeah. four years. Uh, wow! And that's with with an ovulation kit. Like we knew when she was, you know, when she was yeah. ovulating, she'd be like, "Hey, honey, I'm uh, yeah, you know, right you now. Get home, <laughs> like, come on." <laughs> <laughs> so I drive home from work, you know, and, 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 uh, you know, do my part, but yeah, right. just, you know, after, after the third miscarriage, you know, it's, they're very heartbreaking, obviously. And, you know, yeah, of course, especially yeah. for couples, I have a lot of sympathy. <laughs> I see a lot of miscarriages in the emergency department. So, you know, I, having lived through that, like I, I understand how mm-hmm. emotional that is for a couple that's been trying. And, um, you know, we decided to, you know, I had been saving up money and we just decided to go through the IVF route because, you know, she's, ah, right. okay. she's 35, she's 35 now. Um, mm-hmm. and, and really, you know, it, like you were saying, as you get older, I mean, just, it doesn't get easier as you get older, no. uh, for, for a woman to get pregnant and there's more issues with, you know, genetic problems and stuff like that. So, um, and we were really lucky. I think we got five or six, I've lost track like pretty good quality embryos. We implanted the first mm-hmm. one, which is a female, and it didn't take, unfortunately, because there's about, mm-hmm. for her age, this is what the doctor told us, we had about a 60% chance of it taking and right. becoming a full pregnancy, you know, per per attempt. So the first one didn't work, and then the second one with my son was successful, and um, mm-hmm. it's been pretty amazing. So next month, we go back up, to the to portland to do baby number two so we'll see how it works oh, there you so go. We still have them, Exciting. All the on ice. yeah so i've actually okay. i've come off of hcg now i feel like i'm probably good mm-hmm. on that i've been on hcg forever and um mm-hmm. i'm one of those guys i don't know that i felt any different on hcg than off of it so it's like i i don't know that i really need it for my protocol now oh really um oh. so i'm off of it right yeah. now and, you know, I can always revisit that later. So it's right. been successful. Sorry, a long road. I mean, it's, it's long road. It's very, it's an emotional roller coaster for couples and, and it's expensive. I mean, it's, it was $40,000 so far. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. That's what I was going to ask you because I did a little bit of research mm-hmm. here in Thailand mm-hmm. and I expected if I wanted to go the IVF route, mm-hmm. I'd probably have to spend like twenty five to $30,000. Yeah. Um, so I don't mind trying, like not mm-hmm. not that money is that much of a concern uh, yeah. for to have a baby, right? I mean, we'll right. make it happen if it if it needs mm-hmm. to go that way. Mm-hmm. But you know, I we were going to give it like a year of trying, uh, yeah. maybe even a little yeah. bit longer, and yeah. just keep using the fertility medications. I can't mm-hmm. off testosterone completely, and 
you know, I feel that we're doing everything right for myself and for her just to have the utmost highest fertility and the highest chance of conception. And yeah. if it doesn't happen within a year, uh, so we're halfway through already. Um, if if it doesn't happen within a year, then I'm just going to go the IVF route. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. I think that's smart. I think that's smart, mm -hmm. especially if you know it'd be different if there's a ten year, you know, younger. If she was, you know, she was thirty, then right. you know, you could have some some room to play with. But yeah, the you know it's you know obviously men if we stay fit and healthy we can father children like into our eighties. But mm -hmm. there is a biological window there for women. Uh, it yeah. is what it is, and it's it, you just have to deal with it. So it's um, and I know gen I know genetically it's possible because my dad had another kid when he was fifty. Yeah. So yeah. and and yeah. he drinks and smokes. <laughs> so <laughs> right, right. So his this yeah. and his yeah, testosterone levels are like four hundred. So yeah, his fertility parameters are low, and his testosterone mm -hmm. levels are low, and he still got it done. You know, at, yeah. at ten years older than I was. So, yeah. uh, yeah, so I got a beautiful uh, little sister and, uh, oh, that's yeah, she's, yeah, she's that's eight, 18 now or no, 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 13, 13. 13. Yeah. 13. I, you know, I used to be worried about being an older dad, but, um, I, I don't worry about it anymore for all the reasons we were kind of talking about before, yeah. you know, it's, if you take care of yourself and, and you, you, you optimize your health early on in your life. I mean, I, I don't feel 50 at all no. mm -hmm. except when i get up in the morning my you know my joints and stuff are they feel 50 <laughs> but that's my own fault because i you know did stupid you stuff do when I was young. Right? Yeah. yeah i do it to myself right so right. um so you know this kind of a health optimization lifestyle i guess you could call it or a protocol i mean it allows you to, to, to delay things maybe till later in mm -hmm. life that you couldn't delay earlier like it might have been like i don't know I, I i hope you know your dad was probably happy when when he found out he was yeah of course yeah, 50, yeah, it was but, yeah yeah but a lot of men at 50 would have a freaking heart attack um because they're ready to retire and they don't have the energy to chase after a toddler in their 50s right but i feel like i do i know you do um oh yeah so oh, like you easy. know we your biological age is not reflective of how you know you feel and function during the day and so no, it's about how it's, well you treat yourself and then i think yeah, i guess for absolutely. for men like us whether we're 40 or 50 years old mm -hmm. because we have such an advantage over yeah. men in oh, our yeah. age bracket and even yeah. an advantage over men that are 10 years younger mm -hmm. uh our kids Dude. are going to do substantially better better as oh, well because uh, they have proper mm -hmm. guidance at least absolutely. when it comes to the aspect of health you know mm -hmm. So, so in that sense, you know, our kids will be ahead. Like I had a little bit of a rough start with my parents, so I had to figure mm -hmm. it out by myself. Mm -hmm. And yeah. not sure how it was for you, but like mm -hmm. if 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 it takes a couple years to kind of piece it together, and then when you're forty or fifty, you're like, you know what? Okay, now it's finally now I'm finally here. I think for yeah. your kids, it can happen yeah. at twenty year already, Absolutely. just with proper guidance, you know. Absolutely, and you know, you financially like you're just you're just in mm -hmm. a better place, right? You know, for yeah. me, like all of my hard medical training is over. I'm not going to be, I'm not working a hundred hours a week anymore. Like I can be a good present father and set a good example for my son now. And, and hopefully, you know, a couple more kids along the way. I, I, I don't mm -hmm. know. I, I'm, you know, you never know how life is going to work out, but I, I'm really happy right. that it, in some ways that it, it, it took me this long because now I'm in a great place you know to, to yeah like, i mean financial security and emotional yeah, uh huge. you know maturity is is mm -hmm. huge for raising mm -hmm. kids because yeah, how many yeah. how many parents have kids way too early and oh, then their yeah. kids They're are not ready i think i'm not ready just as shitty as they are <laughs> <laughs> it's true i i joke with, with jillian like i mean the bar has been set so low with kids these days that like our kid is going to be a superstar just because he's not going to be raised on junk food and he's mm -hmm. not going to have an iPad and he's not going to be, you know, watching television all day. He's going to be outside right. playing uh, because I, because that's what I insist on. Um, and just, I just take alone, him with like, you, you know? Yeah, yeah. exactly. He's going to be, see me. That's the other thing too. I would say to guys, you know, to, if, if you're planning on starting a family, I mean, you have to do all this health stuff to obviously to get your sperm counts as good as possible, mm -hmm. but it's more than that, man. It's like, you, you you want to set a good example. You want to have those habits already ingrained so that when this child comes into the world, you know, especially if we're talking about men here, because if it's a boy, like, mm -hmm. do you want your kid to grow up and look like you do now? Or do you, would, would you rather then, like get yourself together and, and set a good example? 
and then rather listen to Andrew Tate instead right. of you? Do you really want exactly. that? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. No, thank you. No. 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 Yeah. I'd rather be the one that instills some values yeah. than some internet weirdo. You know. And you want your kid to like, you know, to look up to you. You know, like exactly. I thought my dad was Superman when I was a little kid. But yeah. you know, if you're 300 pounds and die, and he sees you taking insulin shots and you're you're on the mm. couch because right? you're too tired to go outside and play like that, he's going to remember right. that, mm. and that's going to be his reference for what masculinity is and mm -hmm. that's and he's going to end up I, I see it all the time you see the fat dad and then the mm -hmm. fat son and he's just like a little clone of the yeah. dad i see it in the emergency room all the time and it's just like i'm that kid is you know he learned that from his father yeah from the parents i think that's normal so they, what yeah, will happen normal. then what will happen then if you have a bodybuilder who's 300 pounds and injects insulin also and right. steroids yeah. and growth hormone I, yeah it's a yeah, different that, problem that brings right? to the limb then again you know all the bodybuilders that i know they make mm -hmm. for wonderful parents <laughs> like literally yeah. all of them like yeah. all the people in the yeah. fitness community like all the guys that i talk to that uh -huh. have kids they're all wonderful parents and their kids are absolutely stellar because i mean good quality food is always in the house because otherwise you're not a good bodybuilder i think that has a lot yeah, to or, do with it really i mean if i mean it's just the low-hanging fruit right like Mm. eat healthy exercise get lots of sunshine i mean if you if you just can do that at least i mean you're setting your kid up for success you know mm -hmm. not to mention yourself um you know i always i always say like if if we could just get everybody to be like 10 to 15 percent body fat for example i would probably be out of a job uh for a <laughs> lot of the things i do you know me too because yeah, everybody would look good too, yeah <laughs> you know um because you know that would take care of all of these metabolic diseases that uh plague you know the world and maybe not all of them obviously yeah. but it would go a long way it's uh so it's it's really sad to me i I'd always i hate it when i see overweight children coming mm -hmm. into the hospital uh in the emergency department because it's just like i know where that's headed i know and the parents don't know they don't really you know they're too busy caught up with their lives but yeah. i know where that's headed. i know where that kid is going to look like when he's 40. And he's going to be in a bad place. Um, yeah, and, and, the, school, I, and know, the schooling those, system doesn't really, you know, bring this to the attention of the parents, nor do they no. educate regarding oh, no. No, lifestyle. You know, no. you got topography and math, and maybe some science. You know, if you're lucky, and some some languages, some Spanish, yeah. and but you know, like general health management. I, I can't remember no. that was part of my education. No, no, they cut the you know, PE classes. Even, no nutrition classes. Um, no. That's why I tell people like, this is up to you. It's up to us. Like as individuals, yeah. like it's not mm -hmm. going to be, no one's going to save you. No one's going to <laughs> rescue you. Um, you, you've got to learn this. You have to just take the initiative. And, and sometimes I get a little salty about it because it's like, there's really no excuse. I mean, the information is out there. <laughs> That's what phone, I always say. <laughs> yeah. The That's phone, what I always say. you know, this stupid phone here that I'm addicted to, um, is more powerful than the computer that took the Apollo astronauts to the moon. I have yeah. access to all of human history, all knowledge recorded by the entire human race. I can look up on my phone. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the information, it. it's like, you can get it. You just have to like get the initiative and you have to care. And, and it's, um, that's the frustrating part that I run into in this, in my, in my mainstream medical practice, it's just like getting people to buy in, like, it's mm -hmm. like you don't you know you don't have to be this way right like yeah. this, this doesn't need to be happening and they don't it just it's like talking to a wall sometimes so on, on the other hand like i know there's a lot of guys out there that self-diagnose through webmd and wikipedia oh, yeah. and, and <laughs> yeah. i mean i'm the same way right yeah. so when i go to the doctor yeah. uh, a medical professional mm -hmm. i already think that i know what's going on Mm -hmm. So I tell them I need this, this, and this done, and then you yeah. can help me yeah. interpret it. Yeah. So do you see a lot of that in your practice as well, where guys okay. have I like one hundred percent convinced that this is going on, and then you have to kind of either confirm or or kind of defer them from this yeah. self diagnosis yeah. and diagnosis yeah. because this is yeah. this is what we're all terrible in in fitness industry. We all self diagnose ourselves, and then yeah. we take. Uh, you know, everything that's on the uh, World Anti-Doping Agency prohibited list to kind of get <laughs> herself out of that problem. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, so I do. Yeah, I see that a lot. I don't, you know, it doesn't bother me as much as some doctors do. I don't mind having a conversation mm -hmm. if someone pulls something off of Google, but 
Yeah. So what I do see in the emergency department, there's, there's I, I do a lot of, I never thought I would do this like at a trauma center, but like I do mm-hmm. a lot of anxiety management. So ah, okay. people mm-hmm. who are naturally very anxious, nervous Nellies, you know, they get on, on Google and then they go down the rabbit hole and, you know, yeah. they, they started off with a hangnail. And by the time they get to me, they're like, I've got stage four lung cancer. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, let's like, Walk it back, slow like, down, you know, slow yeah. down, slow down, you know, so that, that actually happens a lot. But I also, you know, people that they are, you know, they're intelligent and they, they take the time to look into their condition before they come see me. Like, I appreciate that. I, it, mm-hmm. it actually, a lot of times they're correct, uh, or at least they're on yeah. the right track and it, and it opens up, uh, a, a, it opens up the conversation. And if they're not on track, then I can, you know, at least I have a place to start and I can, you know, we can work right. through that and, and, you know, and figure out what's going on, but I don't get offended. You know, I, I, I it's a partnership, you know, I, and I've said right. this before mm-hmm. on other podcasts, but like, I, I don't, I stopped telling people what to do a long time ago, you know, with their healthcare. Yeah. I'm yeah. here to give you the best advice based on my knowledge and experience that I can so then you can make a good decision that works for you. And if you make a decision right. that's that's not one I agree with, that's okay. That's okay. Well, they're all adults, right? So yeah, we're all they're adults. Gonna, yeah, I and, and I don't a lot like of guys have to, attitude. Yeah. Plus plus a lot of people are stubborn <laughs> until they can no longer afford to be stubborn. I mean, this right. is bodybuilding one on one. Bodybuilders cannot be affording to be stubborn because their health is on the decline, yeah. right? And it's yeah, the same it's with general population. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't get me wrong. I made plenty of mistakes, right? I made high oh, dose well, cycles and oh, yeah. incomplete, you know. Yeah. So, and mm-hmm. then at one point you see that with your blood work and your organ imaging, you're like, you mm-hmm. know what? Maybe I do need to grow up a little bit and take some fucking yeah. responsibility. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. but yeah. it's a learning process, yeah. right? So, so that's why I always, I, I just throw the information out there, right? Mm-hmm. And then hopefully people are mm-hmm. smart enough to kind of, mm-hmm. you know, piece that together for themselves and make that yeah. work for them. Um, but yeah, so sometimes it's a bit complicated, you know, to, mm-hmm. to really get people to step back. Mm-hmm. Hey, I want to circle back to one of your deep dives, which you did oh, yeah. not long ago, about the androgen receptor. Because mm. I found it very, very interesting. <laughs> oh, right? You put everything together. Mm. Um, and I've never seen somebody actually dive into the androgen receptor that in depth, uh, besides maybe me, about mm-hmm. how steroids work. Uh, but it was a longer video yeah so yeah you did like a 35 minute video about the androgen receptor about gac repeaters and that kind of stuff can you, do you think you can narrow it down a little bit like the key points for this podcast sure yeah well so it does okay. really have clinical relevance in my opinion it and and mm-hmm. and it it explains a lot why some men respond one way to androgens mm-hmm. and other men respond differently same androgen same dose same body weight right that sort of thing. Um, the the affinity of the androgen receptor is genetically mediated. We are, you know, we've a lot of people have talked about this, these CAG repeats, polyglutamates, but there's also like these polyproline uh, repeats. Mm-hmm. All of these things interact to to determine how well that androgen receptor functions. And if you right. think about it, it's the binding of testosterone to the androgen receptors. It's like that's just the first step. In this yeah. big long process, right? That's out of the side of one. Line. You have you have two that attach, right? Yeah, exactly. It's a dimer, right? So there's mm-hmm. there's a there's a binding site that makes that happen with a conformational change, and then now we have to get it into the nucleus. So there's transport proteins involved in that, and channel pores mm-hmm. and things. And then now we also have to bind it to the DNA, and then you know unravel these histones. It's incredibly complicated. So yeah. you can imagine like every step of that process is is going to be is determined ultimately by some genetic factors and environmental ones of course too yeah some nutrient intake like i think that zinc and selenium zinc and selenium also Mm -hmm. contribute in this process absolutely yeah yeah yeah, and not to mention uh endocrine disrupting compounds and chemicals that are everywhere that now are interfering with the binding of the uh, interfering with the function of the androgen receptor so this is why, um, you know, there's some physicians out there, and I think uh, I've heard Keith Nichols say this on some podcasts. Mm-hmm. He's a, a well-known guy, I think, in, in, the, in the world of, of testosterone replacement therapy. And he says, for a lot of men, super physiologic levels of testosterone, meaning super physiologic in the blood, are often necessary in order to get 
a adequate clinical response. And it again, it has a lot to do, in my opinion, with genetic variations of the androgen receptor mm -hmm. interference with the androgen receptor from you know a number of different endocrine disrupting compounds, of which there are thousands of them. So you know he states the he states his case pretty well, and I actually agree with him that you know that sometimes you need to push that dose for certain men to get a mm -hmm. clinical effect, whereas with other men you don't. I mean, I, I, right. I have guys and I've seen guys who who feel really good with total testosterones of 600 and, yeah, you know, me free too. testosterone. I know oh, several of them. They're freaks, yeah. though. They're, they're they big freaks. bodybuilding freaks. Yeah. And their blood work yeah. looks perfect. perfect. And you look at their testosterone, testosterone 600. 600. You would think it's 2,000 yeah. based on their muscularity. Precisely. Precisely. Yeah. So it just, show, it just goes to show you, right? Like th this is individualized medicine. All, you know, all medicine really should be individualized. But in this particular um in this particular field, like you can't, so, and that's a good way to sort of identify somebody in the medical world who doesn't really understand testosterone, who says, we need to get your level to X, uh, mm -hmm. because that's, that is, that may not be the case. You know, I, in my opinion, we need to get your levels to whatever it takes to resolve your symptoms. And exactly. for you, that might yeah. be one number. For me, that's a different number. And a big part of that, certainly not the only part, but a huge part of that is going to be you know, genetic variation and the way that the androgen receptor functions. Right. So, yeah, I mean, that boils it down a little bit. Uh, it's super fascinating. <laughs> and I know that we're going to be learning a lot more about that in the next few years. But, um, yeah, it, it, and that's why this cookie cutter approach that you see or, um, you know, the endocrine and urological societies say that you should be shooting for, I think they use the phrase like mid normal testosterone levels is like your target. Well, that might be okay for a percentage of men, a small percentage, honestly, but it's not mm -hmm. going to, you're not going to be able to address the needs of most men by doing that. So approach. I, it, I can take myself as an example, right? Yeah. My, my testosterone mm -hmm. levels are mid normal or mid high mm -hmm. normal six and mm -hmm. 700. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's because I took steroids for 12 years in total. Uh, mm -hmm. So I know what's, you know, behind door, door number two, <laughs> or maybe it's because my muscularity and the physical demand that I put on my body is so much higher compared to where it was before, because I still train like an animal. Mm -hmm. I do my daily fasted cardio, right? I walk a lot. Yeah, I, I do it. all kinds of physical mm -hmm. stuff. I have six cats, right? And a wife, so they all need to be entertained. Right. So I feel, I feel semi androgen deficient. I feel 80% of where I should be, but mm -hmm. on paper, I look, I look perfect. Exactly. Exactly. So I'm not exactly. sure if it's the reference of having like super physiological levels for so many mm -hmm. years or because I put so much demand on my body. But even sure. I consider myself a very healthy 40 year old. Yeah. And even with normal levels, I don't feel normal anymore. Right. And it's not exactly. it's not dopamine. It's not serotonin. It's not GABA. It's not neuromodulation because I'm on top of that. Right. right. Uh, I, I'm releasing yeah, a very squared away there. I'm squared away. Dad, tr trust mm -hmm. me. Um, so it's funny that it also works for a lot of guys who've never taken steroids. Right? They might have like 600, 700, 800 nanograms per deciliter, mm -hmm. but nothing is happening happening at the androgen receptor site. Isn't that interesting? And we could take, yeah. yeah, and we could take androgen receptor sensitivity or androgen uh, insensitivity mm -hmm. syndrome as an example. Yes. These guys have 1,200, 1,400, yeah. 1,600 yeah. nanograms per deciliter, mm -hmm. and they look like your average Italian man, you know, tall and a little bit skinny, mm -hmm. a little bit of a beard, mm -hmm. you know? Good looking dude, but n n no muscle. Right. And they go to the gym, nothing happens. Nothing happens. Libido, yeah. Libido's okay. SHBG is a cruel <laughs> joke of nature. It's like 80 <laughs> or 100 yeah, yeah, <laughs> animals yeah. per liter, right? Yeah. Because it's binding yeah. up all of this androgens because mm -hmm. it, it's just not getting to the androgen receptor. And on Precisely. paper, you would never think that it works. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, of course, you know, zinc supplementation and selenium supplementation mm -hmm. and carnitine supplementation aside, mm -hmm. most of these guys never get out of that thing because the genetic polymorphism on the androgen receptors, their GAC oh, yeah. repeaters are just mm -hmm. non-existent. Yeah, exactly. They're, they're, I, yeah. I know you mentioned in that deep dive that there's like an ideal range of GAC repeaters. Can you go a little bit in depth <laughs> yeah. on that sense? Yeah, so it's highly variable, you know, somewhere between mm -hmm. like eight and uh, like 30, you know, it, 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 and there's some ethnic differences that are sort of subtle and whether they mm -hmm. make a difference or not, it's, it's kind of hard to say. But, you know, most men fall in that like, 18 to 20 range. And mm -hmm. it's hard to say like what, you know, obviously the less that you have, 
the more tightly bound or the more, um, yeah, I guess the higher okay, affinity uh, the receptor is. So, so I guess, you know, if, if you had to pick one, you want to be less. The problem is there is an association with uh, like prostate cancer, prostate, prostate hyperplasia with these very short uh. keg repeats. So there may be an issue there uh, that probably needs to be teased out. There's so much stuff about the prostate that we don't know. Oh, yeah. Well, and I would, you know, defer to so urology experts on some of that stuff. But generally, those shorter CAG repeats, it sounds good, but you may end up trading off, you know, for a higher risk of prostate cancer or maybe some other issues down the road. And then obviously, you know, you mentioned the problems on the other side of that. If you have these very long CAG repeats, yeah, they're just not going to bind androgen very well at all. So there's a right. sweet spot there somewhere in the middle. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot that goes into it, too. I mean, it's just, um, you know, if you're doing everything perfectly in terms of diet and lifestyle and, and you know, and again, all the other factors that I mentioned, it's it's not just the binding of the androgen to the receptor, it's oh, getting it, <laughs> translocating it, all that yeah. stuff. You know, you could have a polymorphism in, in something there that completely screws the whole thing up. And, and yeah, or, or the, 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 you have the other right. So yeah, once it gets to the DNA, it starts transcribing mm -hmm. DNA, right, and turns into yeah. RNA, right, the Correct. ribonucleic yeah. acid, right. and then the ribonucleic acid attaches to a machine. I don't, I'm not even sure what it's called, but then starts pumping out proteins, right, mm -hmm. because it's literally mm -hmm. a one on one. You have the mm -hmm. segments of RNA convert yeah. into proteins, and that yeah. starts folding, and now you have yeah. an aromatized inhibitor. Or you have a sexual binding globulin, right? Or you have mm -hmm. an androgen mm -hmm. receptor. So this is mm -hmm. a, on a very easy explan <laughs> explanation. Mm -hmm. This is kind of how it works. But if any step or any step of this process is, you know, not optimal, then it's a problem. You know, yeah, it's a big problem. Yeah. yeah. And and it could be yeah. something that's genetically wired in your or more than likely something environmental that's interfering with that process. No. Um, again, I, you know, I'm really, I think this whole phenomenon with endocrine disrupting compounds and, you know, industrial chemicals, I think it's, it is, it's, we're going to find out that that is probably going to be the root cause of so many of these issues yeah. in addition mm -hmm. to the lifestyle stuff that you mentioned, but because, you know, we already know that it interferes with the androgen receptor and, you know, mm -hmm. how many other processes and, and how many other places along the, all those complex steps are these chemicals interfering you know, with, with the ultimate end product or the end result. Uh, I think we're going to be discovering over the next few years that it, those, those things are major players, major, major players. Yeah. It's just, we don't know yet. It's still being worked out. So that all, you know, it, 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 it just circles back to the fact that like there's, there is an art of medicine and especially with, with testosterone that you've got to listen to your patients. It's, you know, my old attendings used to say this, you know, about, just medicine in general, like your patient will tell you the diagnosis. You just have to listen. So, um, you know, <laughs> yeah. if you've got a man who's, who's not responding, like they, like you think that they should one, you know, you should always circle back and just, just make sure you're on the right track, make sure you have the right diagnosis, but also, you know, knowing all these things that you, you may need to increase the dose. You may right. need to take it past where you're comfortable. Um, yeah. or where oh, the medical field feels comfortable. comfortable or the medical yeah, field right. feels comfortable. And then, yeah. you know, there's, uh, you, you, you risk a medical board or a, you know, an endocrinologist sort of looking at that and, and potentially giving you trouble over it, even though you're, you really are doing the right thing. So it's, uh, it's challenging because you want to, you, you know, you always want to yeah. do the right thing by patients and you don't obviously do no harm as the first tenant of medicine. But, you know, you can push doses on guys in some cases and see nothing but benefit. So right. Yeah. And, then, and of course, you like you shall do no harm might be different in the eyes of a medical board compared to the oh, doctor yeah. because well, the doctor is working with the patient mm -hmm. and you realize that the reference range is just a number on a paper. Exactly. But the medical board is going to look at that reference range, which is now feminist up to 830 nanograms per deciliter <laughs> and say, this is where you yeah. stop. But wow. in reality, it could be 1100, yeah. but most men feel great at 1500. Absolutely. Right? I bring, yeah. I bring yeah. most of my TRT guys, uh, you know, let's say they're at 300, maybe you double that or triple that. Mm -hmm. And then over time, you slowly bring them up. So maybe in the beginning, mm -hmm. the dose is a little bit low, just mm -hmm. assess response. Mm -hmm. And then later on, they might be at 200 or 250 milligrams yeah, per week. You know, yep. just bring yeah, them up slowly. Exactly. It's 
there's a dialing in process, right? Like we all know this. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, you know, I, with my patients, I, I don't, I don't usually hit a home run right out of the gate, like with the dose oh, and, that's and all that stuff. It takes, <laughs> it takes time. Right. And then as they, yeah. their body composition changes and, you know, they experiment, mm-hmm. I let my patients experiment with dosing frequency to find out what is optimal for them. Uh, mm-hmm. And then they're, they're going to settle in, but sometimes, you know, that's a year, right? It's a year long process of, yeah, it could take time yeah, it could take of, time of doing all that stuff. So yeah, it, it is the art of medicine. It's, I don't know, I, I get blood tests just like everybody else, but it's just, you have to take them in context of the person sitting mm-hmm. in front of you. And that's the big problem with, you know, applying, trying to be as evidence-based as possible. Like some of these studies you know, they, they give you a conclusion. Well, they may be using test subject that really they're not like the patient that's in front of you. So you can't oh, yeah. really apply that to this. Oh, they'll get me started. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, you know, you know me as well as I do. But, <laughs> people so, extrapolate from medical data. That's not yeah, even relevant to people who are physically healthy and active, it, you know, exactly. So if it's, or, or what's even worse, men, what, what, what's even worse is a lot of like animal studies, on male yeah. wister rats, right? Yeah. And then try to yeah. extrapolate from that. What yeah. are the gag repeaters right. of male wister rats in the prostate yeah. <laughs> or, uh, or uh, all the other organs which are being examined? So like, I, I think when you, when you really look at the medical field, I think we're about 10% there. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> where, probably. Yeah. Where, yeah. Where we should be like, you know, mm-hmm. mold, mold toxicity, poorly understood, uh, thallium Absolutely. poisoning, poorly understood. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like, uh, you know, inver- environmental androgen disruptors or estrogen disruptors, et cetera. It's mm-hmm. poorly understood. So I, I think like smart guys like yourself and myself and, and a couple other good guys in the, in our sport and space, um, they understand this, but we're just trying to piece it together with what we have. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and yeah. I, I think I'm sure 20 years from now, I'll look at myself like, things that I know are absolutely correct now, 20 years from now, I'm like, eh, we have new evidence now, right? We learn yeah. as we go. And I'm sure you'll feel the same way. But I, I think, you know, as long as you stay on top of the medical evidence, mm-hmm. the best you can, mm-hmm. and just keep an open mind and open ear, then at yeah. least you're ahead of the curve, you know, because oh, a lot of things like, that we did five years right. ago are already outdated. Yeah. Oh, 100%. It's that the, the old saying, like, half the stuff you learn in school is wrong, you just don't know which half. And, and, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and actually when it comes to testosterone, like not only is it wrong, but it like, the truth is literally the opposite of what was yeah. true. Like the cardiovascular disease myths, the prostate cancer. So like, not only did they tell us the wrong thing, but the truth was actually yeah. the opposite of that. Yeah. That's a weird, so that's a weird thing now, yeah. but there's scientific evidence that shows that testosterone can uh, be one of the uh, key uh, regulating factors of men with type two diabetes. Absolutely. And because testosterone, Absolutely. testosterone improves insulin sensitivity. And then when yeah. you combine it with neurosteroids, yeah. like DHEA has yeah. a very big role in, in mm-hmm. uh, glucose management, glucose homeostasis, yeah. Absolutely. just like estrogen, right? So mm-hmm. it, it's so funny to see that now as, as the medical field develops that mm-hmm. things that were considered the devil are actually now considered to be, uh, you know, medicine. Yeah, exactly. And, and as, you, just as changed, you go it's so slow, like I, I'm impatient. I, I want this to change now. But, of course, you, know, you just yeah, have to course. be patient. And and I think it is like the younger group of I, I work with some cardiologists, um, mm-hmm. then the ones that are fresher out of their training, they seem to be a bit more pro testosterone, or at the very least, they're not anti testosterone, like some mm-hmm. of the older generation docs. So, yeah. you know, it's just a slow, gradual change. But the data is overwhelming, uh, you know, that that obviously testosterone when it's when it's replaced properly and judiciously it's it is a health promoting thing it's, oh sure uh, there's thing. a reason it exists yeah. all throughout the animal kingdom right like fish right. have testosterone hamsters humans like this is a fundamental hormone human hormone um uh women have it too in pretty high concentrations <laughs> what's that <laughs> women have it too pretty yeah, high concentrations yeah. as well women hormone. don't understand this they have more testosterone than estrogen <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that blows their mind. Like they don't. Yeah, that doesn't that doesn't compute. So right. yeah, it's you know the 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 risks are obviously overblown. There are risks, and you you know again that, that's why you you know you see you should see somebody who knows what they're doing is going to take good mm-hmm. care of you, you know, and not do anything you know that's outside of bounds. And 
that's uh that's an issue here in the states like the guys i work with overseas their main issue is they Mm -hmm. can't find any clinics that will work with them i think the problem Mm -hmm. in the states is more the quality of the clinics and the quality of the care because there's trt clinics like on every corner around you know where i live yeah cbd shops Oh, like yeah. weed yeah, shops and TRT yeah, clinics. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and in, yeah, Thailand, cool. in Thailand, we got CBD shops and, mm. uh, and uh, you yeah, know, prostitute uh, houses. Yeah, but TRT clinics are also popping up all mm. over the place, even yeah. in Thailand. Yeah. But here you can just buy Bayer Testofirin or Rotex Medica Testofirin yeah, over the counter right. at the pharmacy. So yeah. another reason to move to Thailand is you, don't, you can't get another prescription. Mm. Just walk mm. into the pharmacy and watch some YouTube videos yeah. and take care of yourself. Nice, you know, but I'm guessing yeah. there's probably not a lot of you know, like physicians that you can, you know, can go to to that are Thailand you know, to- in the private hospitals. There's a couple of good endocrinologists. Okay. Uh, I met a, okay, with a good. few of them. I have a script from one of the private hospitals, yeah. which I don't even know why, but it, I just have it for novel novelty purposes right or every year i get it and i don't even use it now because i'm off <laughs> testosterone completely yeah. <laughs> so i go get it still get it refilled with some blood work manipulations mm-hmm. and you talk with you know the endocrinologist that i go to very knowledgeable studied in the us and then came back okay. to bring that knowledge back to thailand so it's he's very knowledgeable yeah. yeah but then sometimes you talk to people who think that you know steroids are the devil and and of course Absolutely. in a in a tier in a trt clinics they love steroids because they prescribe it and then they also prescribe this is funny this is thailand for you they also prescribe illegally imported third world pharmaceuticals produced in india mm-hmm. um like trimbalone and oh, mastrone all underground and Right. All underground lab, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So yeah. with with synthetic carrier oils that are like dissolving you from the inside and oh cause tremendous systemic, yeah. yeah. So so Thailand is fun, but it's also poorly regulated when it comes. to But it's the same in the U.S. I mean, I was at the uh, you know the Mr. Olympia, and there were several TRT clinics there with a whole lineup of bodybuilders mm. insinuating that you yeah. can look like a jacked bodybuilder yeah. through a TRT clinic. I can't name any names, obviously, but sure. it's. Always surprising to see is like, is this like a front for an underground lab or, yeah. you know, because I getting all these with that, you know, I, it I is, get a little yeah, cringy with this is. because I, I feel like that's going to draw attention to this field in a negative way and cause, you know, government already has. to come in. Yeah. And that's it already has. All the peptides are gone. Anavar, are gone. Yeah. Yeah. They're gone. Yeah. And they're, you know, Probably not coming back. Um, no, unless unless they go with the, the regular peptides that are FDA approved. So Eli sure. Lilly and Nova Nordisks. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's good. Yeah. It's still a good opportunity to buy their stocks. I, I bought it not, oh, sure. not too long ago. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, they're going to have to pay the millions of dollars to, you know, the, to get through the approval process. And yeah, yeah it's, it's a shame. But I, yeah, I cringe a little bit with some of these clinics they're handing out, you know, Winstrol and and all these additional, um, you know, pharmaceuticals that, you know, kind of a dubious, uh, you know, at least for, yeah, for longevity, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this from, as a longevity, mm-hmm. from a longevity perspective and an overall health perspective that, um, you know, they're, they're probably not moving that needle very much. We know, we know that testosterone does testosterone is like a very health promoting thing, but I don't yeah. think adding Winstrol into your uh, your TRT protocol is probably going to do any wonders for your cardiovascular health or so a lot of, a lot of life. people with su- yeah. yeah a lot of people with supposed angioedema problems right 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 all of a sudden <laughs> that's right. what it's prescribed for I know I know <laughs> Yeah, so uh, what I would like to see, what I would like to see, though, like in the future, at one point you have these anti-aging clinics where you can go in for intravenous treatment with NAD+, plus or nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, and maybe some antioxidants, some glutathione, maybe some peptides, right? And that I would like to see in the future, but those need to be as abundant as, you know, the CBD uh, places, right? The, the, yeah. the wheat, wheat shops, because intravenous administrations you would need to do in person. Yeah. So, like for me, for example, I do NAD+, vitamin C, glutathione, B vitamins. I do it mm-hmm. once per week, right? And I swear yeah. by it. I feel that it's highly beneficial okay. for anti-aging purposes. Mm-hmm. And it's just overall sense of well-being and energy levels. Yeah. But I have a private nurse that comes to my house and does it for me, right? And yeah. and 
and I'm in touch with the compounding pharmacy and I'm in touch with the, the, the private hospital. So I can just give him a call and say, listen, mm-hmm. write me a script for 100 files of NAD+. Plus. Mm-hmm. Right? So I can get the, that's This is Thailand, right? In, right? in Thailand, you can just do whatever as long as you're connected and you have the money. Mm-hmm. In the rest of the world, we're not there yet. But I would still like to see it like a real health optimization clinic at every street corner mm-hmm. where you can do things under medical supervision that are mm-hmm. clinically recognized that are just bioidentical yes or at least yeah. you can get from mm-hmm. you know nature right vitamin yeah. c is not bioidentical because you don't produce it yourself but glutathione is right. Right. plus is testosterone is yes. dhea is mm-hmm. <laughs> head pregnant mm-hmm. is and mm-hmm. I think under medical supervision, it's totally safe to take that, even if mm-hmm. the reference ranges don't really say that it's it oh, should yeah. be this high. Yeah. But I mean, time yeah. will tell if those reference ranges will be lowered or or mm-hmm. just abolished. And now now we have new medicine and say, listen, fifteen hundred is okay, and your total testosterone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's and then you know the cost will have to come down, and um, you know if people will want their insurance to pay for it, and you know that's a whole other hurdle. It's, um, yeah, it's, I don't really know where the medical system is going to go over the next 10 years. I, it's not going to be a good place. The, um, no. it, it, essentially, you know, there's, there's a basics, the basics of supply and demand, I think are still obviously going to be very relevant because the, mm-hmm. and the, the supply will always be limited, but the demand I've just seen, like my ER volumes are just skyrocketing with just, with just the amount of sick people that are coming through the door, the number of ambulances that mm-hmm. are coming in through shifts. Like I just don't see it being a sustainable system. And, and we're at the point now where like, I've got people with heart attacks that are waiting two or three days to get admitted to the hospital. So they're in oh, the wow. hallway, they're in a, they're in an ER bed. Yeah. It's, it's the, so something has to give something. Is that, has but to is change. That- Without going into details, is that only the last two or three years? So it, th- there's been hospital boarding or ER boarding has been an issue for a lot, you know, a long time. Okay. Mm-hmm. But I will say that, like the pandemic, I think ex- it accelerated all the stuff that I was seeing beforehand. Right. Um, you know, I, I remember like when I worked at a big trauma center in Florida in the mid 2000s. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I, we would occasionally board people for a day or two until like an ICU bed opened up or something like that. But now Mm -hmm. it's every day and and it's not just that hospital is full. It's like every hospital in the entire state is full for days at a time. And so it's, uh, and it doesn't matter how good your insurance is. It doesn't like none Mm -hmm. of that matters. It's just, there's no beds. So it's, um, and it, and it, it's just the volume of really sick people is just going up. You know, all those people you saw at Disneyland, you know, mm-hmm. all of those people are just like one, one little incident away from landing in the hospital. And that's what they look they get, like. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's it what doesn't they take look much, like. right? <laughs> it doesn't take much to push them over the edge. And and no. those people, I'm telling you, Steve, man, when they get sick, they get really sick. No, they're so unhealthy. They're so unhealthy. So they suck. You know, the no. resource um, utilization is massive. So you know, it's save yourself <laughs> yeah yeah you just, that's what uh, i was telling people like preventative not be in that system yeah preventative is it's just huge. the best way to go it's huge. yeah it's, it's the it's best huge. way so you... if it takes weekly you know nad infusions and um you know that if that's like that's part of that whatever you got to do to stay out of that system and mm-hmm. uh i'm not worried about you 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 and your wife are going to be fine but the general yeah. public is it's in a it's in a bad place man it's a very no, it bad is. place. It is, it is. And to close this off, you're mm-hmm. 50 years old and you're kicking yeah. ass. Thank you. I'm trying. Give a, <laughs> give, yeah. <laughs> give us your secrets yeah, for all the 40, 50-year-olds out there and for the a couple 20, 25-year-olds that are listening now. It's like, okay. I want to be as cool as Andrew when I'm 50 uh, years old. Like, give, us some, yeah. give, us some, give us some guidelines yeah. and then we're going to wrap it up. <laughs> all right. Well, I... It's hard to say, think of off the cuff, but I, you know, being, being healthy and being on a good age management program, I always say is it's actually extraordinarily boring. So it's not exciting. <laughs> like I do the same yeah, thing every true, day. Right? It's boring. Like I, I have, yeah. I have a routine, I have habits and I, I make I, to the best of my ability. I'm not perfect. I make, try to make really good 
little decisions every single day about what I eat, what I do with my body. And mm -hmm. I try to get enough sleep, which now having a child is not happening, but um, you know, it, it's all these little NAD things. Plus. That you do. NAD plus you'll sleep. Quality it. Will be. It. Yeah. It's great. <laughs> you sleep so like a it's, baby. It's not sexy, right? Like being healthy is not sexy. In fact, you're, 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 you're turning down, you know, I'm not, I don't go out and drink with my buddies. Mm -hmm. I, I don't eat junk food. I don't stay up late anymore. Um, it's all these little tiny things that you do. And you, the sooner you start this stuff, you know, you mm -hmm. and I have been, been in fitness in some respect or other since we were teenagers. So right. this is the end result of that is that you get to reap these benefits later, but you know, it's not, it's never too late to like make some changes, you know, and, and, and who cares mm -hmm. if you ever get 19 inch biceps, like who cares? Um, I did. I, know, did. I did. I did for one point, one point in my life. Now I'm like 17. Yeah, well, I, I did too. <laughs> right. I did too. But, but that won't be the most important thing when you're 70 or 80. Um, you know, the most no. important thing is, is going to be able to, to live independently and, um, and have good quality of life and, and mm -hmm. enjoy the remaining years Play with your you kids. Have. Yeah, and you don't want a little be, bit of sex. Yeah. yeah, yeah, a little bit of sex every now and then. You know, it's good. Yeah, with the wife. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I mean, the guys that don't take care of themselves, they don't have those opportunities. They don't no. play with their kids, and they don't no. make love to their wife, and they don't no. go out for holiday. And when they do go out for yeah. holiday, it's in a chair. Yeah, you know, and that's that's kind of painful to see, which can easily be prevented. Absolutely. So I tell guys, just, like, take a long range view. It's you know, we're all all of us. It's tempting to be just to think in the short range, but. Imagine where you want to be in 10 years and 20 years and 30 years. And it's these little things that you do now that will get you there. It's, it's a, right. it's, it's a grind. It's not fun, really. It's kind of boring, but you, you got to do it, man. <laughs> you got to do it. Cause the, yeah, cost, you the do cost of doing, I see the cost of not doing that on a regular basis. I'm telling you, it's not worth it. You know, yeah, the average medical bill it. in the U S is what half a million dollars, a million oh, dollars now, yeah. if you get admitted. Yeah. yeah. Our, we, we, our, our medical costs are higher than anywhere else and our medical mm -hmm. outcomes are like worse than everybody. So it's like, we're doing everything wrong. So, <laughs> so educate yourself guys. It's up to you. Like you gotta, yeah. you gotta find the information. There is good information out there and mm -hmm. um, you just gotta, you gotta put the effort in. It's, it's up, you know, it's up to you. Yeah. It's up to you. Hey, Andrew, this was great. Where can Thanks. people find you? So, you know, you can reach out to me th either through my YouTube channel. Uh, my practice website is just manmedicine.com. You can leave me a message there. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a small private practice. If you're interested in consulting with me or, you know, potentially joining the practice, you can set up a little meeting with me. We do it over a HIPAA compliant uh, video platform and, you know, we can see if uh, we're good to work together or not. Um, but I'm going to continue to try to put out, you know, good quality information that people can use and, um, and, and we'll see where it goes. All right. Guys subscribe. If you like long form content, that's intelligent. Right? Then if you're not up for that, then TikTok is somewhere else. But if you want some good quality content, like Andrew is the place to be. Thanks so much for coming on, man. I really hope that Thank you, you. Uh, really grow a little it. bit more on social media and we'll, uh, looking forward to see what you, you have to offer on your channel, man. Thanks so much. All right, Steve. Thanks, buddy. Take care. Ciao. Thanks. Ciao.